A to cause B. There has to be some sense in which B had to happen given A. So in some sense or other, B was necessary given that A occurred. So there needs to be a kind of necessity connecting A and B. It's not just that A happened and then by a coincidence, B happened. Causation implies some kind of necessary connection between the two. And a necessary connection is expressed in what? A law. So a law that uh, connects A and B just is the way in which necessity is expressed for time. So there, if we're going to view the will as a cause of some end, of some effect, then we have to see its connection to that effect as a necessary connection. And a law just expresses necessary connection. So there must be a law in order to view the will as causal. That law can't be any kind of external position, or else it wouldn't be a free will. And therefore, it must be a law of its own. Um, so there has to be, the will has to act from some principle or else it wouldn't be a form of causality. It wouldn't have the right kind of necessary connection between its choice, the will does, and the effect. Um, so it must be, but it can't be, sorry, but because we already know that it has negative freedom, that that law isn't dictated to it by nature or by objects outside of it, so it must be a law that we give to itself. Um, so if the will has negative freedom and it's a cause, then it must give the law to itself. If the will is a form of causality, well, do it the other way around. If the will has negative freedom, it isn't determined by anything outside of it but it is a form of causality, then its principles have to be able to serve as universal laws. So its maxims have to be universal laws. Why can't you just say that the will's ability to choose its own maxim is sufficient to freedom? And if a maxim is what we interpret as a law that any the will, then just by its universality, So, so uh, isn't the it, so um, doesn't the categorical imperative um, imply that there's some external constraint on what you can do? Okay, so first of all, slight correction because somebody else acting on a maxim that can be universalized doesn't necessarily mean that you have to adopt that maxim. What you, what you have to recognize when somebody else wills an end on the basis of a maxim that can be universalized, that is, they rationally and reasonably willed an end, then you have to recognize that end to be good. You don't necessarily have to adopt that maxim yourself, but you have to recognize, put it this way, in, in recognizing that person as an end in itself, you have to recognize the, the capacity to make their ends good when real pressure. Like, and they've done that in this case. So yes, so you have an obligation to recognize that end as good. Okay, uh, so the problem is what exactly there? Yes, the nation. That's something can't influence 
So, um, if, if you're still freely choosing trust, except it has an influence as good, then freely choosing to, so, um, Right, so you're freely choosing to accept an outside, outside so, influence. So, it, so, makes freedom possible. okay, so first of all, yeah, so I'm thinking about your criticism in the other direction, actually, right? So, um, so when you recognize some, someone else's end as good, that's not a restriction on your freedom. I mean, that's not a restriction on your freedom as any more than your, well, think about this. Um, when you have, when you, okay, so when you recognize some, forget about other people for a second. When you recognize some end as good, when you will some end, and as you reflect on that end that you're willing, to be good, you realize that the only means available to achieve that end are to do something or other, whatever those means are. Okay. And so now you say, aha, since that end is good, these means are good also. Now, is that an external constraint on your willing? I mean, Initially, you only had that end as good. Now you're what? Forced by reason to recognize these means as good also. But that's not a restriction on your freedom. That is your recognition that these means are in fact good. That's not a restriction on your ability to decide what's good. That just is an exercise of your reason. It's not an external constraint on your freedom to choose what's valuable. It's just an implication of your journey. Similarly, you kind of want to argue that when you recognize someone else's reasonable end as good, that's not a constraint on your freedom. That's just an exercise of your reason. Um, so think about the analogy between the operation of reason, practical reason, with respect to a hypothetical imperative, and the exercise of reason with respect to the categorical imperative. Neither one of these is supposed to be any kind of external constraint at all, but simply the upshot of exercising your reason. And so. In neither case is it a violation of your negative freedom. In neither case is it, does it mean that your will is being determined by anything outside of it. It's, it's being determined by its own proper exercise. Is that all? Okay, so. The point here was supposed to be one more time that if we're viewing ourselves as causing some effect, if we're viewing our wills as bringing about some outcome, there has to be some kind of necessity connecting our choice and that outcome, or else it wouldn't be our causing it. Uh, and if we are going to view ourselves as having freedom from external determination, that necessary connection has to be what we ourselves have produced. So we have, therefore, a positive understanding of freedom um, in which we're bound to act according to principles that could be universal, could serve as universal laws. That is, maxims that could be universalized and therefore, in accordance with the categorical imperative. When you say necessary connection, you don't mean like a physical necessity, do you? Physical necessity. Metaphysical necessity. Metaphysical necessity. Um, well, I'm 
So I'm not sure what you mean by that. I'm a little hesitant to go into exactly the kind of necessity here because, um, because causal relations don't hold under all circumstances whatsoever that you could conceive. Right? So, um, So causal laws, so I don't know, think of, um, uh, think of, I don't know, think of a law in chemistry, for example, that um, when you um, introduce a spark to a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen, there will be an explosion. Uh, so, so, you can state that more precisely if, if you want, but um, saying that there's a law there means that there's a necessary connection between the, the cause and the effect. It's not a random sequence of occurrences. On the other hand, there certainly are circumstances in which introducing a spark into a mixture of oxygen and hydrogen is not going to cause an explosion. So, so it's the exact nature of the, of the necessity associated with these laws is a delicate issue. Um, I just want to establish, I just want to keep into that there's some kind of necessity involved uh, in order to get calls out. You have something more specific. I'm just thinking in terms of the possible world's necessity. Right, exactly. So, so one way of thinking about the kind of necessity is in possible worlds. Uh, so possible worlds are going to extend beyond the actual world. And um, to say that there's a causal connection is to say that there's a, you know, that sequence in mm, more possible worlds, right? maybe, really, maybe closely related possible worlds. Right. So, 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 so causality is a form of necessity, and necessity holds across some possible worlds. Yeah. OK. Um, bottom of 56 to um, 57 then. Natural necessity, he says, so this is um, causality of natural science. Natural necessity was a heteronomy of efficient causes. What was that? Natural necessity was a heteronomy of efficient causes.